Amen. Awesome. All right. Let's give it up. Jimmy. <clears throat> so uh, last weekend, we had an opportunity to be a blessing to a family, Dan and Joy Hines, and the church gave over $20,000 to the couple. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, here's a couple that has nothing. And uh, I got a text from Joy, and she basically said, we are literally absolutely blown away by the generosity of your church. Uh, just to give you an update, Dan is going to be going into surgery on April 11th uh, to take care of the third diagnosis of cancer that he's had in his life. And so they're going to be doing that. He was supposed to have surgery on the 4th, but physically he was just not up to it. They couldn't do it, the surgery. Uh, so they're hoping to be able to do it on the 11th. And um, so that was a huge blessing to them. And thank you guys so much for being, you know, getting it, you know, getting the big picture when it comes to, um, you know, well, the kingdom. And we always kind of, maybe in some, somewhat of a rudimentary way, uh, basically say we're just trying to get everybody's name in the book. Um, that's what Easter is all about for us. Uh, we're, re you know, celebrating the resurrected Savior. He is alive. And we praise Jesus for that. Uh, but at the same time, we want the community to know that. And we know that everybody goes to church on Christmas Eve and Easter right? That's why our attendance typically doubles uh, on those days. Uh, but what we want to do is, is we want to kind of get them in here and tell them about Jesus and how they can have a relationship with him and how that changes their life forever. And so the, the way they come into the church typically is by you guys. You know, you guys are the ones that are going to go out and invite them. So uh, invite them to come in and we will give them a chance to accept Christ. And so um, anyway, we're excited about what God's going to do uh, with Easter. So I think all of us have learned that nothing worth doing is ever easy. You know, when it comes to your marriage or friendships or finishing college, it's not easy to finish college. Uh, it's not easy to stay healthy. It's not easy uh, to have a successful career. Uh, it's surely not easy to live for God. It's not easy to do that at all. Um, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of work to be able to do these things. And, you know, one of the things that I found in, in Philippians is that, you know, Paul basically right before he died, said to Timothy, he said, Timothy, you're, you're like a son to me, and I just want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I, I want you to know that if you make a decision to live for God, it's not going to be easy to do it. And what's going to happen is, is if you make that choice, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer persecution because you're going against the tide, and you're making a decision to live a godly life in an ungodly world, and it's not going to be easy, right? And so, Honestly, when you read verses like that, and I say things like that, it's probably not the best sales pitch, is it, to live a godly life. Hey, live a godly life, it's really hard. You know, or hey, live a godly life, there's going to be a lot of pushback and persecution. <laughs> Sign me up, I, I want to be persecuted. Um, but it's a fact, you know, it's a reality, it's what happens. And um, so, basically, Paul, who was an expert at persecution on both sides of the spectrum, he was great at persecuting the church, and he was persecuted incredibly as a believer. Uh, here's what he says to his son of the faith right before he dies. 2 Timothy 3, 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's not a matter of if, it's always a matter of when. It's going to happen. But then there's a verse that he says before it that is amazing. It's a game changer verse. This is what he says in verse 11. He says, you know how much persecution and suffering that I've endured. You guys have known it. He goes, you know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. He starts naming off all these cities. You know what it was like for Paul in Lystra. I mean, when Paul was in Lystra, they stoned him, and they thought they had stoned him to death. So they were dragging his bloody, lifeless body out of the city and basically throwing him in the dust. And the Bible says that a group of believers surrounded him, and while they surrounded him, he stood up. And like a freak of nature cyborg, he walked right back into the city. I'm like, are you crazy? If I was with Paul, I would have said, are you kidding me right now? Well, you're going back in. I would have stopped him physically, uh, but he went back in anyway because he was a freak of nature when it came to being a missionary and standing up for God and, and believing that God was going to protect him. And, and he went through an awful lot of persecution. But here's the thing that's so cool about it. The, the phrase right at the end of the verse says this, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. So here's the end of the story. The end of the story, which you can hold on to as absolute truth, no matter how tough it gets, no matter how difficult it gets, standing up for God, living a godly life, making right choices, if you're going to get some pushback, when you get the pushback, when you go against the tide, when you get persecuted, know this, that the God of the universe will deliver you from all of it. Amen. He will deliver you from all of it. And so you don't have to be afraid. 
You know, and so this is a father talking to a, a son in this particular case. And so now what, what, what we're basically talking about is the fact that every single one of us are in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's a struggle. And it's a knockdown, drag out struggle. It is not easy at all. It's one of the most difficult things that you're going to go through in your life. And I always say that Satan, your enemy, will attack in 3D. He uses things like deception. He uses division. He uses discouragement. He uses deception because he's the best liar out there. He's an awesome liar, right? And I don't know about you guys, and I'm going to be kind of transparent with you. Everybody comes up to me and says, you're the most transparent. Here's what, I, here's what I'm thinking. There's a whole lot of stuff I'm not telling you. <laughs> Trust me. There's some stuff I'm not rolling out, all right? That ain't happening. There is some stuff I'll roll out. Not everything, all right? But I will tell you this. I struggle with my mind. I do. I struggle with my brain. And I don't know about you guys, if anybody else does. Matter of fact, if you struggle with your mind, raise your hand. Make me feel better. Thank you. Woo, I feel a lot better. I'm not a freak up here. All right, so honestly, I do struggle with it. And one of the things that I struggle with a lot of times is just, you know, like the Bible talks about vain imaginations and lies and things in my head that I'm construing to be true that maybe aren't even true. They're the furthest things from the truth. Maybe it's a person's opinion of me. Or maybe it's something in my body physically that I feel, you know, is happening. Or, you know, maybe it's, you know, the, the fact that I'm feeling like I could never, ever possibly, and I'll talk about this later, but measure up or be good enough or whatever it may be. All I know is, is that my mind can be consumed with lies. And it's, it's, it's devastating. It's a devastating thing. Um, I love this verse in the King James Version. It's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 5. We got it up on the screen. It basically says this, casting down imaginations. Imaginations are the things that flood your mind that aren't necessarily true. Things that we are thinking are true, but really there's no factual basis that they're true. Or things that we think are true because maybe this is going to happen possibly in our future. Well, that's an imagination. Not necessarily true, right? So what do we do? We cast them down. What's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is, you know, imaginations are going to stand up against or exalt themselves against the truth, which is I refer to the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is the truth. The imaginations in our mind aren't necessarily true. They could very well be a lie from your enemy, right? And so they're standing up against the knowledge of God, which is the truth. What's the way to navigate through this? What, what do we do? We bring into captivity every thought. One thing about your brain, you know, it's a vast, vast thing, isn't it? I don't know how many times I've, somebody whose kids come up to me and they've said, hey, they're going through this and they're thinking this. And I always think, boy, the brain is a vast thing, isn't it? Just a huge old thing, big old thing. You know, when it comes to all kinds of things that we bring into our life and thoughts and, and directions that we go in life. Can I see that verse one more time? Sorry about that. I need the verse again. Um, but the cool thing is, is the Bible says that you bring these thoughts into captivity. Now, the, the word captivity is an interesting word because what it means is, is I'm isolating each thought. The ones that are based on fact and truth in God's word, I'm going to meditate on. The ones that are based on imaginations and fear and lies, I'm going to hold them captive. And the cool thing about holding them captive means that I isolate them, I capture them, and here's what the word in the Greek literally means. I send it away, I lead it away captive. So basically what I'm taking the, doing the, with these thoughts is I'm leading them away from my mind. Believe it or not, you get to choose what you think. Amen. I get to choose what I think. You know, thoughts pop in there. Trust me, it happens all the time with me and all of us. But we get to choose what we meditate on and we get to choose what rents space in our head. And so the Bible says that we have this possibility or this ability to take these imaginations isolate them and lead them away captive out of our brains so that they don't cause problems in our mind. So what do we do? Well, every thought is going to be instead based on the obedience of Christ, me living an obedient life and following him and basing my life on his truth and his word. So that really is the key, you know, when it comes to this whole deception thing. And, and I said too much about it, but the next thing is division. He tries to use division in your life. You know why? Because he knows you're better together. He knows it. He knows we're better together. So he wants to divide us. I look at every, and I know this is a, a sensitive subject because everybody struggles with marriages, but, you know, I look at a husband and a wife that God brings together. 
sometimes we look at our husband or wife and we think, oh, God brought me together with you so I could be happy and so I could just be my best, be my best friend, you know, and man, we just, oh, everything, we love everything together, you know, or whatever. And I'm always thinking, mm, good luck. <laughs> it's going to get tough. <laughs> Here's my number. You're going to need it. <laughs> It sounds kind of negative, right? But all I'm saying is, is it's true, right? And the whole thing with that is this. I don't look at it so much as God put you together so you could just be the happiest little guy in the world. I'm not saying it, whatever. He put you together because you're going to be effective at advancing the kingdom as a team. And I always say this, and I think I said it last weekend. He put you together so that you guys could be a team a team for God to get people's names in the book. That's why you're together. And so what's Satan trying to do? He's trying to divide you. He's trying to divide you. When you see that division happening or that, you know, all that start happening in your life, just know where it's coming from and know what's going on. You're in a spiritual battle and he's trying to split up the gang. He's trying to split up the team, you know, that is effective at getting people's name in the book and that is effective at, at advancing the kingdom. He also uses things like discouragement, and that's what I wanted to focus on today. Can I just say this? Discouragement is a very dangerous thing. It's a very, very dangerous thing, and it can come out of nowhere. You can be having the greatest of days. The next thing you know, the next day, you don't even want to get out of bed, and you're saying, I have to brush my teeth. Brush your teeth, and you're like forcing yourself to brush, you know, to go through your motions and get into your day. I'm telling you right now, discouragement and sometimes even depression can come out of nowhere. And it's a dangerous thing. And a lot of times, here's what we think. We think, well, God says that we're supposed to be filled with joy. So the reason for that is because God doesn't want Barry to be sorrowful. You turn that frown upside down, Barry. <laughs> That's what I want for you. That's what I want for you, right? That's not what he's saying. Let me tell you what he's saying. He's saying, Barry, you're in a knockdown, drag out battle. And discouragement is dangerous. I'm not just trying to cause you to escape sorrow. I'm trying to cause you to be effective in a war. And the, the opposite of discouragement is joy. And I want you to have joy. And I believe that every time you choose joy over discouragement, you're walking up to Satan and going, hey, Satan, what's Boom! Just out of the blue, you're just punching him right in the face. And I know that sounds a little weird, but it's true because it's a battle and it's a struggle. And choosing joy is essential in a battle. That's the whole point. Now, there were people in the Bible that did things that blow our minds. They did amazing things for God. They were amazing people of faith, and yet they got discouraged. They got discouraged. You know, I think about people like Job. Job went through some trials, didn't he? You know what? God allowed Satan to have free reign in Job's life, pretty much. And Job got to the place because of the actual influence of Satan in his life. He got so discouraged. This is the comment that he made in Job 3. He said this, I wish I would have died at birth. That's what he said. He got that low. I wish I didn't even have this life. I wish I would have never had these kids. I wish I would have never had been married. I wish I would have never gone through this in my life. I wish I would have died at birth. I'm going to tell you something. Discouragement is a dangerous thing. I think about Jonah. Most of us think of Jonah as the dude that ran. Runner, chicken. I'm going to tell you, if I was Jonah, I would have been in the whale too. I would have been smack dab in the middle of the whale. I would have been running as fast as I could. I think about Nineveh. Modern day Nineveh is Mosul. I think about all the people that inhabited Mosul, people like ISIS and everything that was happening. And what if God said, Barry, I want you to jump on a plane and go to Mosul and walk the streets winning ISIS to Jesus? I'd say, not happening. <laughs> not going to happen. I'd be in a whale, okay? I'd be in a whale. Because the Assyrians were ruthless thug freaks. And Jonah didn't want any part of him, and I don't blame him, you know. So he ran, ended up in a whale, went to Nineveh via whale, big fish, got there, and then ended up having the greatest, one of the greatest evangelistic campaigns ever in the history of earth. 
Commentators believe that 250,000 people inhabited the town of Nineveh. Lots of people. And he walked in and basically said this. Didn't make it flowery, just said this. Turn back to God or he's going to kill you. Peace. <laughs> and he was out. Right? Well, he expected the whole place to implode and blow up. So he went on a mountain to watch it all happen. Popped some popcorn. And it didn't happen because everybody from the kings all the way down decided to repent. 250,000 people at one time came in sackcloth and ashes, turned to God because of what Jonah's ministry was. So he's up there on a mountain and he's sitting under a plant and a big plant grows and he's got the shade of the plant and God kills the plant and he starts mourning for the plant that died. And God was trying to teach him a lesson that how could you mourn for a plant and not mourn for the lives of the people of Nineveh? But the crazy thing about it was out of the blue, this is what Jonah says. He basically says this, I wish you would just kill me. Depression and discouragement can come from nowhere and sometimes happen over things that are stupid and don't even matter. You can get so down and so discouraged and so sad. Elijah was the same way. One against 450. And actually there were 400 prophets of Asherah. So it's really one against 850. What are the odds? One against 850. Well, he had God on his side and he won. And it was an amazing thing. But when Jezebel found out about it, what did she say? I'm going to do the same thing to you, Elijah. You're going down. So what did he do? He ran and he isolated himself. And when he isolated himself, he prayed to God. He said, God, would you please just kill me? He got that low. He got that discouraged. These are people that did great things. Jonah, phenomenal prophet. Job, godliest man on the planet. God is literally saying, have you considered Job? Great guy. I mean, God was saying that about Job. Elijah, amazing prophet of God. And yet they got so discouraged that they didn't even want to live anymore. I'm going to tell you this. You're in a battle. And so what does God do? Through an obedient man by the name of Paul and through a small group of people in a place called Philippi who were going through a lot of persecution and who were living a life of complete and abject poverty, God comes up with a message for you and for me. Every single one of us in this room to say this, joy is essential in the battle. Joy is essential in the struggle because depression is going to come, discouragement is going to come, and we need to make sure that we choose joy. So here are five things that we can do to have joy. Number one, just choose it. Choose it no matter what happens. Now, it's easy to say, you know, to walk up to somebody and say, well, you just need to choose joy. That's your problem. You ain't choosing joy. You ought to choose joy. You know, whatever. Okay. Well, I don't want to right now because I am not really happy. I just got really bad news or, or whatever it may be. I'm telling you right now, it's a very difficult thing to choose joy at times. But here's the thing. When we're discouraged and when we're exhausted, we make the worst decisions. We really do. I have said that time and time again, that when I'm discouraged and when I'm exhausted, I'm going to make a wrong decision when it comes to a relationship, or I'm going to make a wrong decision when it comes to a responsibility that I have in my life. Why? Well, because I would much rather do what's easy than what's right. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's how you feel sometimes. Because everybody gets to the place in their life where they make, the, they make the comment, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. Literally, not one more day. I am so done with all of this. You're like, yeah, I said that yesterday. <laughs> Look, I know what it's like. Because I've said it too. <laughs> and then I always say to myself, because I always counsel everyone, I'm a counselor. I always say to myself, stop lying to yourself, white you can do it another day. Shut your trap. <laughs> That's what I would say to myself. But we're all hard on ourselves, I guess, for sure. But the fact of the matter is we all get to that place in our lives. And so we think about Moses' life and we think Moses was amazing. He had amazing faith. I just picture Moses, you know, holding up the staff and the Red Sea parting. And I always, look, I always thought Moses' face was probably like this when the Red Sea was parting, like, because <laughs> he didn't know it was going to part. He didn't know what was going to happen. He was freaking out. So the Red Sea parted. I think about when he stood up to Pharaoh with courage. I think about how he held up his staff and, and they were able to win in the battle. All the different amazing things. A lot of times we don't read this verse about Moses. In Numbers 11, 14 and 15, it says, this is Moses. He says, 
I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor. Spare me this misery. Love Moses. That's what Moses said. I'm going to tell you, Moses got discouraged. Moses got to the place where he was incredibly discouraged. And discouragement is a very dangerous thing. And so here's the message in Philippians 3, 1. Whatever, by the way, this is a message directly from God to you. I have a message from God for you. And I will say this. Lots of times, I've been doing this for a long time, people come up to me and say, Barry, I have a message from God for you. And sometimes I think in the back of my mind, oh, great, here's another message from God. Sorry. (laughs) So if you say that to me, I might think it, but I'm going to smile. And I'm going to probably hug you. So just keep giving me messages. It's good. The reason I say this is a message from God is because I'm directly reading from his word. All right? You know this is a message from God. Here it is. Philippians 3, 1. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And I love what it says after that. It says, I never get tired of telling you this. Why? Well, because I don't want you to be a sorrowful. No. He says, because this is safe for you. You're in a battle, and you need to have joy in the battle, in the struggle. He says, this is going to safeguard your faith. Now, I'll tell you this. Sometimes the only way you're able to choose joy in a difficult time is, by, is through faith. That's the only way you're going to do it. You get the phone call from the doctor and you get the bad diagnosis. And you say, wow, I sure am filled with joy. Or the boss calls you and says, we don't need you any longer. Woo, it's a great day. Praise the Lord. Man, I've got joy. It takes a lot of faith to have joy in a situation like that. It just does. So what you're saying is this. That kind of faith says this. It says, no matter what happens with my circumstances, God's word never changes. So I'm going to hold on to verses like Jeremiah 29, 11. Even though the doctor called, I'm going to say this. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for despair. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Even though the boss calls, I'm going to say, do not be afraid because I am with you. Do not be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. You make a faith choice and you choose joy. The second thing is this. There's joy in relying on Christ. Greatest thing in the world. Greatest, pr- it, 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 it relieves, it's liberating to know that it's not based on my human effort. That it's based on my reliance on Jesus. I love that because Satan always fills my head with things like, you never measure up. You're not good enough you stink, you know, or whatever. I'm telling you, my mind is flooded with those things in every major area of my life. So what I want to do is look at Satan and just go, no, duh. I know I'm not good enough. That's why I'm relying on Jesus. Take that. (laughs) You know, I don't know. Having a conversation with Satan. But the bottom line is, I want to be able to rely on him because it's, it's liberating to know that it is not based on my human effort, not even my salvation, you know, not, not me walking in, in him and, and, and having the strength that, you know, I need to be able to do what God has called me to do. He's going to provide me with all of that. And I, I struggle with that. You know, I've struggled with feeling like I measure up. And I've always told you that ever since I've been the pastor here, you know, people have always, you know, come up to me and said, hey, can I talk to the pastor? And I would say, I'm the pastor. And they would say, you? You know that? Literally, all the time. It's happened all the time. Well, I know. I just want to see the senior pastor. I'm the senior pastor. (laughs) And they're like, okay. They always have this look like, you're doing this? And I think sometimes God puts people in positions so that he gets glory. You know? I remember one time, this guy was walking down the aisle up in Massachusetts. Walked down the aisle, came up to me, shook my hand. He said, man, I think God wants me to be in the ministry. I just want to thank you for, um, you know, just being an example to me. And that you're the reason why I'm getting in the ministry. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. And then he said this. He said, I thought if you could do it, I could surely do it. <laughs> Literally, that's what he said. 
in the front of the church. That's God's way of saying, you're going to be humble. I'm going to humble you low. Bring you down. All I'm saying is, it's never been about your effort. Thank God for your effort and keep on keeping on. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus is going to be working through you. Jesus is the one that gets the credit and the glory for anything that happens with you and through you in your life. Jesus is the one that gives you the strength. All I'm saying is this, relying on him and depending on his strength when you don't measure up gives you joy. It gives you joy in the middle of a battle, especially when Satan's trying to fill your head with lies. Philippians 3.3, 3, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who truly are circumcised. We rely on Christ Jesus, on what he's done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Verse 8, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Sometimes I don't think we realize what a valuable thing it is to know him. It's the most valuable thing that you have. There is this little phrase one day that people will stand before him and he will say this, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. If you know him, it's gold. How do you value it? Well, the Bible says it is of infinite value. And when you compare it to anything else in your life, everything else is as garbage. It's not really garbage, but it's, you know, knowing him is so much value that it appears as everything else is garbage when you put it next to knowing God and knowing Christ. It's that valuable. It's that huge. When you know him, you rely on him. When you rely on him, you have joy in your life. Number three, there's joy in moving past your past. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever, the Satan has held your past over your head? He does it all the time, and I'm raising my hand too. Some people raise their hands. I mean, he does it all the time, and he does it to me a whole lot when I'm I always start having these failures pop up into my head about the things that I failed in my past. Always when I sit down to write a message, I'm like, okay, really? That's how you're going to be? You're going to bring it up now? Okay. All right. Literally what I'm thinking is God must, God's going to use this message because this is a battle. This is a struggle. And he brings up those past failures. But here's what the Lord does. The Lord gives us this thing called forgiveness. And because I have forgiveness, I have a future. And literally, the best way to not focus on my past, the antidote to focusing on my past is to focus on my future. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, I've got a prize for you. A prize. Think about Paul. Do you think Paul, ever at night when he was sleeping, had dreams of seeing Stephen's face with blood pouring down Stephen's face as he watched Stephen be stoned to death? Do you think he ever thought of that again? Yeah, I think he probably did. I think he probably thought about the families that he put in prison just because they followed Jesus. I think those things just kept creeping up in his mind over and over and over again. Why do you think Paul in chapter 3 verses 13 and 14 says, I haven't achieved this, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly what? Prize. I have had to get to the place in my life where I've exchanged my past for the prize, where I've exchanged the past for the future. Because of the forgiveness of God, I can move into the future because there's a prize waiting for me. And I'm not going to focus on the things that are pulling me down anymore. The fourth thing is there's joy in restoring relationships. So there's this couple, this, these two ladies that are in the church at Philippi. And I want you to see the verse. The Bible basically says when that verse pops up pretty soon, it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 2, it says, Now I appeal to Yodia, and I, I always call this lady Sintich. It's the com- absolute butcher of a pronunciation. It's the wrong pronunciation. The reason I'm pronouncing it Sintich is, let me give you the right pronunciation. The Y's in this name are U, okay? And the C-H-E is Ch, okay? So here's the way you pronounce the name. Suntu Ch. So I'm sticking with Sintich, am I right? <laughs> so here's what the verse says. Now I appeal to Yodia and Sintich. <laughs> Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. So they had a disagreement. We know that. There was a problem with the relationship. But the cool thing is, is he didn't really focus on the relationship 
or the disagreement. He focused on their value as people. Look what he says. He says to his true partner, he says, please help these women. Why? Because they worked hard. They've worked hard with me in doing the most important thing. They have spread the gospel. These are amazing women who have incredible value, who have worked hard in the faith and in the ministry. They've also worked with Clement, not to mention all the rest of the co-workers. Please know this. Their names are in the book. They're family. I'm not just going to take these ladies and kick them to the curb because they're a problem. But I see their value, and I've seen what they've done, and I've seen their contribution. And so I want to restore joy in this assembly. I want to restore joy with these ladies. And I want these ladies to be able to have their relationship restored. And I want all of our relationships restored. Let's do this. You know what? When you restore relationships, there's joy. And you think in your heart, well, there isn't. Trust me, Satan is the one that's dividing us anyway. If you're restoring relationships, you're directly opposing your enemy. And I can guarantee you, instead of discouragement, you're replacing it with joy. Restore relationships. It's so huge. The last thing is this. There's joy in contentment. Contentment is simply defined as this. It's the state of satisfaction. Basically, when I'm content, I am satisfied with the level of provision that God has given me in my life. I'm satisfied with it. I'm satisfied with the house you've given me. I'm satisfied with the car that I drive. I'm satisfied with the position you've given me. I'm I'm satisfied with my family. I'm satisfied with all the things that you've brought into my life. I'm satisfied. God, thank you. And he may change all those things. He may double, give you a a, a bigger house. He may give you a smaller house. He may give you a better car. I don't know, a beater car. I don't know. Just be satisfied with the level of provision that God has given you and trust that he's going to meet your needs. You know what you're going to have a lot of? You're going to have a lot of joy. You're going to have a lot of joy. Because it's easy to get discouraged about all of these things. He says in Philippians 4.11, not that I was ever in need, for I've learned, and that's important, I've learned. It's not an easy process, but I've learned how to be content with whatever I had. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, listen, that is the most important decision you will ever make with your life. And we always say in your 2.5 seconds of a life, it's a very, very short life. Make a decision for Jesus while you have time, while you have life, while there is a chance. It is not a coincidence or an accident or some random thing that you're in this room today and hearing this gospel. The gospel is a simple thing. You like the gospel? It's a churchy word. I don't even know what it means, the gospel. The gospel is a simple word. It means good news. That's all it means. You love good news. I love good news. We all love good news. Here's the good news. Even though we're all sinners, we don't have to be separated from God forever. Even though we're all sinners, we don't have to have that heavy guilt on our back. We can have it eliminated. We can have it washed away. God, who loves us so much, came up with this penalty for sin. It's called death. So God himself, because of his love, because of his forgiveness, because of his grace, decided that he would actually come to earth and pay the price that he himself made, death. So he, in human form, his name Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, came and died on a cross, and he was buried in a tomb, and three days later he rose from the dead. That's what he did for you. What's he asking from you? He just wants you to believe it. Just believe it. And it's not about me getting up here and proving it with formulas and algebraic equations. It's about you making a decision. I heard the gospel. I choose to believe the gospel, and I'm going to make it a part of my life, a central focus in my heart and life. That's a choice. No matter what your background is or what you've been taught, you can choose Jesus this morning. So I'm going to give you a chance to do it, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray a simple prayer right where you're sitting to invite Jesus into your heart. Why don't you pray this if you'd like to. Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know this from the bottom of my heart. I believe. I believe because I choose faith. Not because it's been proven to me, but because I heard the good news that Jesus died for my sins and that Jesus rose from the dead and I believe it. 
I choose to accept you as my Savior. And I pray that you would wash me clean. I pray that you would give me hope. I pray that you would make me a part of your family and change my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you for joining us today on our live stream. If you have any questions about your next steps, we'd love to connect with you. Please visit parkvalleychurch.com slash next step. If this ministry has had an impact on your life, then join us in reaching others by going to parkvalleychurch.com and going to the giving tab. You can also give online through our app. There's all kinds of things going on at Park Valley Church, and we'd hate for you to miss out. So be sure to check out the events page on our website or go to the events page on our app. We're so glad you joined us today. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here at Park Valley Church.